Hello, Miguel. Hi, Michael. How's it going? Good. Good. Looks. Let me check the room here and see how many participants we have before we get started here. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. We're we're ready to go. Uh, I'm just going to read this um, opening statement, welcoming you, brief bio, and and then we'll get started. Sounds great. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Ori Charles. I am the Hugh Roy and Lily uh, Kranz Cullen Distinguished Professor of Painting here at the University of Houston. Uh, we're, we're here, I'm sorry, we're pleased to have everyone here. And um, before I get started, I just wanna, uh, before I get started with introducing my guest and friend, former student, I should say, um, it was a pleasure working with you and uh, while you were in graduate school at the University of Texas. I just want to note that we will have a question and answering period at the end of our discussion or talk. And I encourage you to add questions to the chat and also to the Q&A uh, sections as we proceed. Uh, and we will get to as many questions as we, we could at the end um, of the lecture. Today, my guest is um, Miguel Aragon. I've known Miguel since he was a graduate student at the University of Texas in Austin um, when I was a professor there. Uh, he's originally from Juarez, Texas, I'm sorry, Mexico. And before attending the graduate program at UT Austin, he was uh, an undergraduate student in uh, printmaking at uh, University of Texas, El Paso. That I didn't know. <laughs> Um, he now lives in New York City, where he is an associate professor in printmaking at the City University of New York and Staten Island. Uh, Miguel's work has been shown extensively nationally as well as internationally in both solo and group exhibitions at venues including the Print Center in Philadelphia, the Bissonnette Gallery in Italy, uh, the SNAP Gallery in Alberta, Canada, the International Print Center in New York, and the Kala Art Institute Gallery in Berkeley, California, and the Cleveland Museum of Art. He's received numerous awards and participated in artist residencies in the US and abroad. And his work has also uh, been included in numerous publications and uh, catalogs most recently, uh, a 2012 publication, a survey in contemporary printmaking. Finally, his work is included in many public and private collections, as well as the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, uh, the Witherspoon Art Museum, and the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Miguel for our uh, discussion today. And you've been busy since, uh, <laughs> what was it? Uh, uh, 2012. That's 2012. When I yes, that's when I finished wow. off then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm really happy to be here joining uh, the University of uh, Houston. And I want to thank Marcus and Aaron for, and you obviously for putting all of this together. Uh, I'm more than happy to share my, my work and my experiences. Um, my so yeah. Um, I'll, let I guess, you, I'll let you get started here. Yes, uh, so let me share my screen. I have uh, several images prepared. And so I'm gonna try to go through them. Um, and I might, I might go through, them, through some of them a little bit faster just because I know we have a time uh, concern. But I wanna start with this piece, which is actually the newest one um, that I've made. Uh, it was done over the summer. I'm sure you all probably recognize this, um, this newspaper cover from the New York Times. And the reason that I'm starting with this piece is because I feel that it actually encaptures everything that I've been doing within my work over the last you know, decade, basically, or more than that, actually. So, um, I mean, as probably all of you, when, when I saw this, this cover at the New York Times, I was just struck by all the names, um, you know, that these represented simply 1% of all the casualties due to COVID 
um, you know, that we, we're still experiencing. So um, I picked up a copy of the newspaper and one thing that struck me was that the, the names became sort of obscured within all this text. I mean, I think the New York Times did a really good job of not only uh, putting the names of the, of the people who have been unfortunately um, lost their, their life due to COVID, to the virus, uh, but you know they they included a small small text telling telling the, the reader who they were and and what they have achieved sometimes, but at the same time I felt that the, the names kind of got lost. So one thing that I did is using the racialist language, I decided that I needed to somehow highlight this amount of numbers. You know, the, as the New York Times says, an incalculable the incalculable loss that we have, you know, because of COVID. And I released this piece, unfortunately, when the US uh, hit 200,000 deaths. So um, that was even, I mean, now it's even more poignant, I feel, you know, with this piece. So um, so what I, what I did was I, I went and individually, very carefully edited all the, all the names and their ages through, this, uh, through all of these pages of the New York Times as you can see here. And then um, I collected it, collected them, put them all in the same sequence as the New York Times had them and transferred those names onto this simple object that could actually, can actually save lives, which unfortunately has been polit politicized so much that it's um, not everybody is willing to wear one. So I, you know, so I, I made them a little bit more enhanced as far as making sure that the names become readable, the age becomes predominant, and that this, you know, their life could have been saved simply by some everybody else wearing a mask like this. Um, and then using those same newspapers, um, I, I decided to create an, a variation of the piece where I, I use the cyanotypes um, technique to basically capture once again the absence of the names. And this was like, once again to enhance or make it even more apparent this uh, incalculable loss or incomprehens incomprehensible loss. Um, and so these are, you know, just some of those, uh, some of those pieces that ended up resulting out of, the, out of it. So um, what I wanted to say with this piece is that, you know, it shows how I'm particularly uh, interested in utilizing erasure, not as a destructive act, but rather as, um, as a rebirth of, of that erasure. You know, when, when something is raised, it, it doesn't really get destroyed, but rather it gets purified and it transforms and hopefully into something else. So um, I'm gonna go now into my primary body of work. I'm originally from Juarez, Mexico, as Michael pointed out. And so this is in the border with El Paso, Texas, as probably most of you um, are aware. And so growing up in the border was some, something that was really, um, you know, having the, the best of two worlds. You know, this is before 9-11 when crossing the border, it simply meant crossing this bridge. You know, within five minutes, you would be in a different country and be able to uh, immerse yourself in a different culture. So unfortunately um, in Juarez, 2006 came in and the Mexican president at the time decided to declare an official war on drugs. And so um, the city changed completely in that various cartels decided to fight for the plaza, this is how they call it, you know, for the area to control it so that they could uh, transfer um, drug through, uh, through Juarez into the US. It, it is one of the main corridors and it still is. So this caused such a devastating scene that the Mexican president decided to send large, large forces of uh, pol federal police and eventually even the military to basically get control of the area because in 2009 and 2010, the city became the most dangerous series in the world. Um, and so this really altered and affected the city. I was still living back then, um, you know, 2006 to 2008, I was still living in the city. So I saw a lot of the change that the city kind of happened uh, during that time. And so uh, this is the first piece that I really feel comfortable showing. And actually this piece was done when I was doing my master's in, in, in Austin. Obviously when I, I was in Austin between 2009 to 2012, and during that time, I, can, I could not stop thinking about my, my hometown because it was happening uh, all the violence that was happening and my family and friends were still living there. So this piece follows uh, a photograph that I actually 
I saw on the on the newspaper, the local newspaper in Juarez. And as you can see, it follows all of these characters. And I'm sure you can tell, you know, what kind of characters they are. And then I'm skipping a few images, obviously, here from the series, but the the, the image ends there. And so, I mean, I illustra illustrated this photograph, and you can see, or you could you can imagine what it what what happens next or what would be you know, the next image, which I decided to edit and, and actually not, not create because I think it is apparent, you know, once again, removing using erasure as language. So um, I'm gonna show you just a, one photograph for a couple of seconds, just to give you a sense of what it was that the citizens in Juarez were experiencing on a daily, on a daily basis and multiple times uh, on the same day. So those were the kind of images that we were exposed um, at the time between you know, 2006 up until 2012, actually, and even further than that. Um, really, death was on the streets. You could literally walk out of your house, uh, walk a few, uh, a few blocks, and really run into a crime scene. It really was that bad. So as I, as I mentioned, it was something that I could not you know, stop thinking about during that time. So I ended up developing a technique, which was you know, just kind of part of my own research practice as far as you know, interested in materials. So what you're seeing here is part of that technique that I developed where I use a laser engraver or laser cutter to actually engrave photographs into cardboard. And so this allowed for the cardboard to actually get burned and create a layer of soot on the surface. And it also allowed me to be able to come back and remove uh, specific areas so that I would be able to create uh, relief into these plates and then just printing them in a traditional intaglio way with, with damp paper, that suit will be then transferred onto paper. So while I was creating this, uh, this next body of work using this particular technique, I was thinking obviously of uh, the disasters of war by, uh, by Goya and also Otto Dick's portfolio of um, the war, which is based on, on World War I. And you know, he was a soldier who actually experienced all of this. And so these were moments that he captured in his own work of, of his own personal experience, which in a sense is simple, something similar that I'm doing. So this is the resulting body of work that came out out of, um, out of developing that technique and using, so what I did is I utilized the photographs that I, was, I started to collect uh, from the newspapers. And actually these photographs or these images, I've been collecting them for a long time. I mean, I mentioned that the, the official war on drugs started in 2006, but the violence really has been in the city for a long time. I mean, I remember in the, in the mid 1990s already collecting the newspaper without really knowing why. They just, the stories kind of captivated me. And these images, these are directly from the newspapers. In Mexican culture, um, you know, images of the, of the cadaver or crime scenes are not so taboo. And so they were actually uh, printed and published um, on, on the main page. And so this was my access of being able to actually take all of these images and transform them through software, editing them. And what I'm thinking here is, I'm thinking of the, all of this as experiences that we want to forget. So the resulting from the, from the process itself, I am trying to remove these images that have been you know, somewhat burned into our and our consciousness, you know, everybody who has seen this. And so there's direct connection between, with, between the subject matter and also um, the, the technique itself in that the machine is burning physically the cardboard and so it's creating that layer of suit. And when a body is shot, the, the skin actually burns when it's shot up, up, up close. So there's all of these uh, different sort of moments that I'm trying to connect between the process and the idea. The, obviously, as, as if they're being printed, it creates different layers of embossment, which for me kind of represent the different layers of trauma that they might have created you know, within, within the viewer who has experienced all of these events. And so, as I mentioned, I've been collecting the newspaper for a long time before, before I actually started making this work. And it got to a point where, you know, when this was when I was living in Juarez with my mom, um, my closet in my room became so overwhelmed or overtaken by all the newspapers that I had because uh, it was happening daily. And so I needed eventually I started feeling a burden of actually just looking at all of those newspapers and knowing that inside those newspapers, there were stories and there were crime scenes and there were all these people who were losing their lives. And so it became a burden to me to just see these pieces. And I wanted to translate that in, onto the viewer in a physical and, 
and visual way. And so what I created was this installation where I casted um, a bundle of newspapers and then created multiples out of those. And for the installation itself, I decided to utilize the actual newspapers. So here you can see some of the local newspapers from Juarez and you know the main one being El Diario de Juarez and then also the, the PM, which is a more um, uh, sort of like yellow, um, well, I, I, I forget the, the, the actual term here in the US, but it's uh, Periodicos Amarillistas, which is, you know, the, the newspapers that are more sensational. And so they, they would actually uh, show these images even in a more raw and crude appearance because they're sometimes they were actually even taking those photographs before they, the police actually would arrive to the crime scene. Um, one thing about this uh, particular piece was that I actually told the museum that it was, um, I wanted to be participatory. So whoever came into the space, I wanted them to actually move this, <clears throat> these newspapers and pick them up and read them. And if they wanted to take them home, they were more than welcome because my, my purpose it was to, is to inform the viewer of what's happening in Juarez at the, at the time. I mean, now it's actually all of Mexico. And so what I did is I actually placed some of the newspaper in between some of those concrete pieces because I also wanted the viewer or the visitor to actually experience the heaviness of you know, having to move one can, uh, cast of those uh, bundles and be able to be able to reach out uh, and pick up the next newspaper to be able to read the stories so, so that they would actually feel physically what I was feeling mentally and emotionally in that particular sense. So based on those same uh, images that are coming from the, from, from the newspaper, um, eventually, because I moved to Austin, Texas, I, I had to I had to scan them, and you know, like um, my my research kind of changed in the sense that I couldn't I didn't have access direct access to the newspaper, so I ended up having to rely on online sources a, a, as well. But because I had a scans of all of those images and those those stories, I decided to just expand my body of work and concentrating on on, on portraits on the faces. Of these people, and once again using erasure as language, you know, trying to erase the crudeness and 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 the violence really that these that these people suffered, you know, and and in how their their life was taken, to to purify them, you know, so that their face would not look as, um, um, so that the violence would would leave away, and they became become clean somehow. So these are some of some of those um, exercises that I did with some of these portraits, where chemically I was using uh, printouts of this of these photographs, and then trying to erase the photograph itself to purify the, you know this, their soul in a sense. But at the same time, it was being transferred to another substrate, so it was creating you know this uh, diptych of the same image, and hopefully you know, one that became more abstract and something that becomes more pleasing to the viewer, but still keeping a little bit of resonance of the violence and what, you know, what, what those events are all about. So I am, as an artist, I am very process-based. And so I'm always trying different, different techniques and trying to come up with different ways of not only entertaining myself, but also of, uh, looking at uh, uh, sort of at the subject matter from different perspectives. So this is another, another, a project that I did where once again using those portraits um, and using uh, pins and needles through a screen, I wanted to create um, pa uh, paper, sheets of paper where the image would actually not be visible, but it would be more of a watermark within the paper. Unfortunately, these experiments did not work. However, the, I ended up um, feeling that the objects themselves became interesting enough and strong enough to really show and, and, and talk about what what my idea, my idea is about these portraits, you know, these people who have been uh, mutilated, mutilated, tortured, and really gone through a lot of violence within their body. And, and I felt that these particular images or these objects actually capture some of that. So this is a, a, an, a detail of this particular piece. Um, so then after working the, uh, with, uh, with this piece, and by the way, I'm not actually going chronologically. I'm just kind of, you know, putting the, the work together as it makes more sense. Um, so this piece is by an artist, Mexican artist named Teresa Margolles, and this is an actual cinder block wall from her native town of Culiacán in Mexico, and it shows the aftermath of um, of an execution in front of the in front of the wall. So you can see that you can see very clearly see all the bullet holes 
in the cinder blocks and you can see all the numbering from the forensic team, you know, as they're trying to decipher, you know, what happened in, in this particular shootout. And so looking at this piece, um, it gave me the idea that, you know, they just resemble pixels. And because my images now lived online um, or on a, on, in the digital world, I decided to just blow up these portraits in larger than life size. And so that it would allow me to actually punch them or drill them in this case, you know, one at a time using the different drill bit sizes. So I, uh, this is a studio shot from when I was doing my master's in Austin, Texas. And you can see that I decided to create multiples. I mean, I'm, I was trained as a printmaker and I still consider myself a printmaker even though my work is not really traditional print but more of a conceptual or experimental print approaches. But they, I'm still using the multiple as part of my work. And so I created different variations for the image. And part of the reasoning for that is because I assign different meanings to each of those layers. I mean, of course, the first, the, the real Xerox um, was the original Xerox was for me to just be able to utilize and drill through the through, the, through these portraits, um, and then the paper became, you know, stand-ins for the skin and the bones and perhaps even the soul. So there's there's several variations for the images. This is the the final the final piece where it has the Xerox um, the, the Xerox printout with a sheet of paper on behind it. This is just a sheet of uh, one blank sheet of paper. And then this is a black sheet of paper and all of the, the, the tones are actually created through the, du the dust by, you know, by using the drywall as a backing. So as I'm drilling, it's creating all this dust that is actually being impregnated into, into the paper and be able to create the piece that way. And the interesting, the interesting aspect of these particular pieces is that these pieces can continue to evolve. Every time, every time I show them, they change because the, the drywall dust, even though it's, it's somewhat adhered to the piece, is not permanent. And so the tones kind of change and the aura of the, of the figure actually becomes unique every single time I show them. And, you know, after many shows, showings, there's still, there's still plenty of that pigment uh, within these pieces. And then, of course, um, I have the drywall, uh, which, interestingly enough, captures the violence even more so than the paper. When I when I was trying to develop this technique, I honestly didn't think that the paper was gonna uh, hold up. Uh, I thought it was gonna be more of a performative act or performative piece, but um, I ended up finding out the paper is actually quite strong and it held the violence pretty well. And the, the, you know, the stronger material, which I thought was the drywall is the one that actually became so uh, severely damaged as you can see on this particular piece. So I've been able to show this when, I, when I'm able to make them on site um, but they are, um, they live primarily just on photographs as this. So this is a, a detail of these pieces and not all of them survived. Unfortunately, actually, as I was making the pieces, sometimes they would just completely collapse on me because they were being abused so much. So once again, you know, tying the process with the idea of utilizing violence to create the image as these as this bodies or these people, you know, were taking out of this life um, is, is the connection that I'm trying to make. And so going back, to that first uh, sheet of white paper, um, I decided actually recently in the last couple of years, I've been going back to those pieces and utilizing them as stencils to create an, a, a fourth variation where I'm using uh, copper, copper enamel, metallic copper enamel, um, spray painting it through, through this stencil, paper stencil and onto a black sheet of paper. And so the idea here is once again, you know, recreating this, this portrait or recreating this figure, this, this person. And um, the reason that I'm using copper is because there's a saying in, in Spanish, which says, uh, está sacando el cobre, which translated into, into the US would be the equivalent to you're showing your true colors. And then also um, people of Latin or Hispanic descent, we're told that we have copper toned skin. So that's sort of like the connection that I'm trying to make with these pieces. Uh, these are some um, installation shots from exhibitions. Just to give you a sense of how um, I am trying to confront the viewer when they come in and see my work. I wanted them to be lar larger than life size because I want to confront the viewer into really seeing these portraits, you know, really seeing these people who have been taken out of life. Um, in a really violent matter and to show what is happening, you know, in the country now. I mean, I started in Juarez, but now really after several years, I had to uh, concentrate in the entire, the entire, entire country. And unfortunately, this is a problem that hasn't gone away. 
And one thing I should mention is all of these casualties, all of these people, they come from all sources. They are uh, obviously officials, either uh, municipal, federal, or even um, from the army. They're also cartel members, but they're also uh, innocent bystanders who had no connection with, with the drug trade. And so the reason that I'm doing all of this is because I'm not really judging all these people, specifically the cartel members or the police who might be, uh, who might be crooked, you know, who might be um, on, on the cartel side. For me, the, uh, what, what this work is, is about is the fact that Mexico is losing generations of young men, you know, primarily between 20 to 40 years old and all of, all of it because of this, you know, so-called war on drugs. And um, so this, I'm not, as I, I want to reiterate, I'm not playing, putting judgment to, to the decisions that these people made, but rather I'm trying to humanize them. And so this is one of the reasons that I, I started with a more um, abstract approach, approach of using those laser engraved pieces where the image becomes almost a landscape that is really hard to read at the beginning. And it's not until you spend enough time with those pieces that they actually become visible or legible to the viewer. And then once you really see them, you cannot forget that image anymore. Uh, I was always um, amazed to see people when they, when they see those pieces in that at first, they always have a smile on their face because they, they don't understand what the image is or where it's coming from. And after a couple of minutes of looking at the image, the body or the portrait reveals itself and they understand where it's coming from. And the smile changes to a, to a certain degree, but the viewer doesn't stop looking. And this is exactly what I want. I want the viewer to not look away because this image has already existed. I mean, they were on, on, on the newspapers, they exist on blogs, they exist on the web. So it's not like I'm reinventing the wheel here. It's not like I'm showing something that is not being shown. It, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to humanize them. All of those photographs, I mean, most people will look at them for a couple of seconds and then turn away because who wants to live with those images in their brain, right? And, and I'm hoping that the way that I'm approaching this body of work or you know, this, all these different techniques is that it's actually gonna slow down the viewer and make them uh, appreciate more the fact that this were somebody's brother, somebody's father, somebody's friend, uh, somebody's uncle, and that we are losing all of those men. So um, you know, these last pieces were much more monumental. So uh, here I'm just showing an, again a studio shot of how I had to basically you know, make them into different sections to be able to create these pieces. This is the largest one I've made so far. And this was actually part of my thesis show when I was graduating from Austin, Texas in 2012. And um, it's one of the few full bodies that I've made. Unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to be able to exhibit in places that are, that really have you know, a large scale wall so that I can you know, take the challenge of creating more of these pieces. There was that previous piece uh, that was also a little bit larger, but not as large as this one. This is the, definitely the largest I've made so far. So after many years of working with this particular technique, um, I was approached by Flatbed Press in Austin, Texas, and they wanted me to come and do some work with them, um, particularly additions, which again, as a printmaker, um, you know, I kind of knew how to do, but I haven't done traditional prints in a long time. So, but they, they really liked my work and wanted to, to collaborate with me. So I told them, look, um, it's, I can definitely see making these pieces in traditional wood blocks and you know, be able to make additions out of them. And at the time I just wasn't interested before uh, Flatbed approached me. So I told them, let's, let's, try, some, let's try that. I mean, let's, let's definitely do a couple of additions where I'm using the same, this the technique that I developed and create images that way. So these are some of the shots you know, from when I was doing my residency there with them. So this is one of those pieces. And then this, uh, this, this is the second wood block that I made. And uh, while I was there, I wanted to challenge myself as an artist. So I told them, you know, I know I can do this, even though I haven't done them before, I know that they will work but I want to try a different technique and I want to challenge myself. And if it works or if it doesn't work, you know, let's, uh, um, you know, let's still try it. And they were willing and, you know, they had faith in me. So we, they got me a piece of a copper plate that is quite large, as you can see, they're the same size as my, as my, my hand drill pieces, which are roughly 48 and a half inches by 36 wide. And so what I did for this piece, what I wanted to create was create different tones to have more depth, more volume within the piece. And I also wanted to have embossment. So I ended up drilling into the copper itself, 
which at first I was dreading because I thought metal was going to be much harder than drilling on wood. And I ended up finding out that it's actually a lot easier and a lot softer. So it became not an issue. Um, the, the problem though was that I had to recreate, I had to create this image multiple times because I had to create different layers to be able to uh, to utilize them for the aquatin process where um, each layer will be become one a different tone. So it was still very physically demanding. Um, as you can see here, these are just some process shots of us, you know, kind of covering some of those areas in order to prepare them for the uh, for the aquatin uh, bath. And then this is us, or you know, them rather uh, pulling up roof of the piece. And then this is the final piece, which um, I'm really happy with it, with the result. And it, it really came down to the last day of, of my stay there with my, of my residency. And we're in talks of actually, you know, me coming back and doing more work with them. And I'm, I'm excited for the opportunity, hopefully uh, once we're on the side of the other side of the pandemic, you know, we'll, we'll be able to have it, make it happen. Uh, so this piece again, you know, has different tones, different layers of of, uh, of gray tones as well as embossments. A lot of those tiny little white dots, they're actually physical, and that's one that's one what I wanted to make with with these pieces. And after making this work, this were done in 2016, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. It kind of you know they kind of got me into the bag of printmaking, and after seeing them work, I decided well I'm going to try to make more of these pieces. So. I went back into my studio and uh, went through all of these images that I've been, you know, collecting from uh, from the from the drug wars, and decided to just make um, woodcuts once again using that that same technique. Uh, but because by then I had already started experimenting with uh, this idea of creating multiples. Um, so that I could have stencils as well, multiples of the of the drilled paper. So I could have stencils. I ended up developing these images into different versions, where I have the woodcut itself, and then I have this um, second version of the image where it captures the um, the figure once again in this copper tone. You know, the this, the Mexican the Mexican tone, skin tone um, per se. And once again, the idea here is that I'm hoping that I'm you know, somehow purifying these bodies and purifying these people and getting rid of all of their, all of their misgivings and all of their um, uh, wrong um, attitudes and, and wrong choices and hopefully make it humanizing them. That's, 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 that's the hope. Now here, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, so this is another project also done roughly in 2016, if I'm not, believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I was invited to do a residency in Germany, in Pennemunde. And this is the place where racket technology was actually developed and in, invented. This is during the World War II era. So Bernard von Braun, who was instrumental in putting men on the moon, was actually the lead scientist in this particular factory. So this is obviously under the Nazis and they were trying to develop this rocket tree, this rocket technology, not to send men to the moon, but to actually bomb the allies. So these are just photographs of the space to give you an idea or give you a sense. Uh, these are the two rockets that they developed. This one here, the uh, the, the green one, is the V1, which is which stands for Vengeance uh, Weapon One, and then the other one is the V2, which is Vengeance Weapon Two. Um, and so once again, this is just to give you a sense of the space. You know, uh, this residency lasted the entire summer of that year, and but they didn't have a space for artists really. This is. This, this uh, facilities are now a museum, but they're more of a historical museum rather than an art museum. So we didn't have any space to really work. And I'm saying we, because um, there were two artists who, we, uh, who were invited, myself and a Spanish artist, Gregorio Iglesias. And so there's me walking around the space and this is Gregorio and me walking inside the, fa the, the former factory, just to give you a sense of how, how the space kind of looks. And of course we were offered an exhibition after the residency. So, you know, being careful in that I didn't know, I mean, I don't count, I don't have any German heritage and, or, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like um, removed from this particular history or story. Um, I, ha I had to be careful, uh, you know, what kind of work I was gonna make. I knew that I wanted to try something different from my body of work from, from Mexico. And I wanted to utilize the history of the space. So with that in mind, I created all of these stencils that kind of mimic or resemble the architecture or you know, all of those mechanical you know, machines that they had. And then utilizing what I had on hand, which is this coal, 
that was the former power plant, by the way, uh, and how they created energy to be able to, you know, provide uh, the energy for, for, for this particular project there. So using that coal, you know, for making prints that way, using those stencils. So these are the stencils themselves. They ended up becoming pieces. And then I also utilized wood from the area, burned it so that I created ash. And then, you know, uh, ad adhere that ash onto those stencils after I created some, some other prints, you know, utilizing the stencils again. So um, I'm trying to capture the history of the space in a way. Um, I walked around the entire, you know, facilities because it's a really huge space. And so I would find all these mechanical things just kind of laying around. And so I started playing with those in, in making marks, you know, thinking as a printmaker, thinking as an artist who's interested in, in process-based work. Um, you know, I transferred this rust onto paper and then I would use that rust or that paper that already had those markings. And once again, using the dirt and using the coal and using enamel paint to create, you know, pieces. So this is me kind of working uh, on those pieces. Uh, that's a detail of, you know, how I was laying some of those, uh, some of that debris to be able to create these pieces. And then uh, the pieces themselves ended up being like this. So these were, these were done not on paper, but rather on vellum, which is semi-transparent. And I knew, I limited my palette to these colors because I knew that I wanted to, you know, sort of talk about the, the experience of, you know, what would it been what would it what would it look like you know living there at the time and seeing those explosions of uh, the rockets failing or being bombarded by the allies you know once they found out about this uh, this uh, this space um so i'm trying to capture you know in a sense all of this um uh, sort of history that uh, that happened in that space and then using this as stencils once again for creating cyanotypes and the reason that i wanted to use cyanotypes was because cyanotype was used as, as uh, as a technique for creating blueprints, which in essence is, you know, how they were creating all of the schematics for building all of these machines, you know, these rockets. At the same time, it kind of talks about aerial photography once, you know, the, the allies found out about this place, they had to fly over this, uh, this area and take photographs, you know, to be able to figure out where they needed to bomb to make sure that their, um, the Nazis didn't develop this technology. So what we were doing in this residency the curator of the museum had an exhibition already planned that had uh, spoke about the history. So it's showing a lot of the objects of uh, the development of the rockets and what was happening at the time, but he didn't have anything uh, purely visual or not a lot of visual rather, but it was more informative, you know, a lot of graphs, a lot of, um, a lot of objects. And so he invited us to actually be part of the exhibition. And that ended up being a good thing for me in that I, it gave me, it allowed me to actually try to do a maquette of what my final installation was going to be for the for the space so this is um this is a detail of that particular piece but then the, for the actual exhibition i ended up creating this much larger uh piece within um inside the power plant and so this is just to give you a sense of the scale um and again i utilize all of these variations so a lot of those cyanotypes were done creating uh, using those uh, those films, you know, those vellum pieces that I created, and then uh, they also had the window frames, the original window frames from the from the buildings, and because it's now a historical uh, building, they can't they have to show them, they can't throw them away. Um, so I asked if I could use them as uh, stands, basically for creating new pieces. And they grant me that uh, possibility. So I ended up developing these other pieces. Once again, thinking of me kind of being, you know, what it would have felt for the workers being inside and then hearing the explosions or, feel, or seeing the explosions of either the allies bombing the space or the, the rockets just simply failing and, you know, seeing all of this um, aftermath. Um, so these are just um, some installation shots um, from another exhibition. And out of that, uh, I was able to, we were able to actually create a catalog, which is actually available. You can buy it on, on amazon.com. I believe they still have several copies. And so I'm really proud of this particular project. The image on the right, that's Gregorio Iglesias. He made another project um, also based on the history. And obviously I'm on the left. All right, so going back to Mexico, um, I'm running out of time here a little bit. So going back to Mexico, over the years, I went back because my family still lives there. And I saw the change also that the city kind of went through in that everybody 
they went into their houses and they became bunkers. They became self-imposed prisons because the violence was so bad and they just didn't want to go out anywhere anymore. So it's kind of crazy to see all of this, you know, architecture in being, um, you know, the, the security measures, you know, being implemented in that raising the fences and then adding razor wire and then adding um, spikes on your roof so nobody can walk on your roof and be able to get into your house that way. And the city still looks like this because even though the, the violence kind of uh, went away for a few years and unfortunately now it's come, kind of coming back in the last couple of years, it has been going up once again. Um, it's something that is just kind of stayed with uh, with the citizens. We are, we have been basically, um, we have um, post-traumatic stress in a sense. I mean, we cannot forget what happened and therefore we still kept these security measures. And unfortunately it's, they're still being utilized today. As I said, you know, the violence is kind of coming back. It got to a point where neighborhoods even closed themselves in. Like they created all these illegal um, private neighborhoods by basically shutting down streets illegally. This was not um, approved by the government, the local government. So this was a street, you know, close to where my mom used to live. And it was an open street, open road, and the, the neighbors decided we're going to close it. And there's only going to be one entrance for coming into the, into, the, into the neighborhood and going in and out so that they could, you know, be able to feel secure that way. Uh, but of course, you know, we have to live ourselves. We have to live and we have to try to be happy as, as best as we can. So what do we do? We put, you know, Christmas lights on the, all of this, you know, try to forget that we're living with violence, that we can still go out and unfortunately see cadavers and, you know, all of this still happening everywhere. So this is more my, my most recent work. And I'm, I kind of am going back to those original photographs and becoming more figurative in the sense that I, now I'm actually not concentrating on the cadavers, but rather on um, the forensics or the police themselves. And this is just, uh, again, you know, trying to look at the problem or the subject matter from a different perspective. So uh, these are aqua tint pieces. And the idea here is that I want to make several of these uh, of these pieces so that I can uh, have an exhibition where all of these are going to be connected. So you can see that the, the police uh, tape line is doesn't go exactly the, on the same spot. So they're going to be, you know, in different, in different heights. And that's the idea for the concept that I have for this piece in that you will be surrounded in, in the space by all of these crime scenes that are connected by this police line that is never ending. In a sense, it will continue to loop around because unfortunately this problem has been going for 14 years already and there's no slowing back. If anything, as I mentioned, it's kind of ramping back up again. Um, these are the two newest pieces that I made last year with um, in Texas actually uh, with Jeff Dell and his students at uh, Texas State university and these pieces unfortunately you have to see them in person because they have an effect where the body itself actually glows there's a fluorescent um color on the back of the of of the body or of the you know the covering of the body and you can roughly see it right here on the outlines but in person it's much more apparent much more visible so this is what i'm hoping to continue doing you know um for as I continue to, to explore this, this subject matter, this is another, a large woodcut that I did also in another residency. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, this, you know, this uh, idea has been kind of continuing in my work. Um, and that's basically all I have. I, I am online, I'm, that's my website and that's my Instagram handle. If anybody wants to, you know, join me and follow me. And so, yeah, I guess uh, we're open up for questions now. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and you, Michael, you're uh, you're muted, so I can't hear you. I just want to say thank you again. That that was uh, pretty amazing, uh, very you. thorough, and I appreciate your honesty uh, in in all of this. You know, we have. Um, a few questions lined up, but before we get to that question, I, I, I want to um, ask you uh, about, you mentioned eraser. Um, I think of it as a strategy in making, it has a history within the art, the, uh, uh, art production. Um, it, you know, I, I could think of another uh, artist, uh, most recent uh, um, Titus, uh, 
um, African American artist Tida Kapar, I believe, who, yeah, who right. does uh, deal with negation, uh, erasure, removal, subtraction um, mm -hmm. as a um, an aesthetic device. Um, can you talk about what it is about your use of that that continues to be present in your work? Uh, because I saw that when you were dealing with uh, the the uh, sorry the rust in uh, you showed us an image of of different pieces of of metal and they seem like these white patches that existed in your prints. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, it contradicted what was beneath it. And it was uh, obviously the white in the prints function as contrast uh, to that which is around it, which is a lot of little pieces. And I, I, I'd like to hear more of your thinking about erasure and, and your, your own use. Yeah, well, I mean, basically the, the, the idea of erasure really came from the very beginning in the sense that, um, you know, I was exposed to some of these images physically firsthand. And so, you know, this idea of, of not wanting to have those memories, you know, trying to erase them from my own memory and from my own consciousness, that's where the idea of erasure kind of came about in that I, how can I, how can I make work about this, but not see these images and get rid of them, but make them, you know, make, make them justice too, you know, give them justice to what happened. And so, I, I am always looking for ways of, that I can use erasure in a way that will always give me another substrate so that I'm not completely obliterating, you know, whatever existed before, but rather that I'm transforming it into hopefully something much more positive. So that's kind of the way that I'm using erasure in that, you know, not as a destructive act, but rather as a purifying or as a creative act. Um, I have another body of work that I didn't show, which I did uh, in, in Hawaii when I was doing a residency there, where um, at the time the volcano was quite active and it was actually, you know, spraying lava and it consumed a lot of homes. And an interesting thing that I learned from talking to the locals was that even though it was destroying their houses, they saw it as a, as a creative act in that they, they kept telling me Pele, which is the, the mythical god or the mythical name that they have for the volcano. Uh, Pele was creating new land. That's how they saw it. And that, that's how they've always seen it in their history. And that's very similar to why, how I think with this uh, idea of erasure in that nothing comes out of, something comes out of this, um, you know, erasure or this uh, taking out. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your so question. You, so you, entirely. your use of erasure, do you see it as an act, uh, as a, a regenerative act? Correct. Yeah. I'm trying, uh, you know, for, you know, for those portraits, I'm trying to take away the, all the violence that those bodies experience. You know, the original photographs are gruesome. They're crude. If, if you saw them, you know, you would not want to see them for, for long. And so I needed a way to present them to the viewer in, in, in a sense that they would be subtle and that they would, that violence would not be as apparent, but rather that, you know, um, the viewer would be able to connect with those portraits. And I think by stripping out all the color and the way that I've created this, these techniques that still show the violence, the portrait becomes more, more readable, more accessible. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the times visitors or viewers have told me that they look like they're sleeping. They don't look like they were dead or, you know, they were dumped in, in a street or somewhere. So that violence is, it, it is gone in some, in my pieces. And the viewer is actually able to concentrate on the facial features, you know, the, who this person was. We're gonna, we're gonna circle back to that, but I have another couple of questions. I, I wanna start with uh, this one. Um, have you shown these pieces? Um, of, I'm sorry, have you shown these pieces of the sheets and rock prints in your hometown? If so, was there any feedback from the victims, families and friends or original photographers of, uh, of how you immortalized the subjects? Um, and do you wanna share and what, and, and want to share to the rest of the world what happened, what's happening in, in uh, Mexico? But, latter part, I'm sorry, I'm not clear on. Yeah, so I, I have not shown specifically in Juarez, but I've shown in El Paso, Texas. 
and a lot of people from Juarez came and several of them were uh, families of people who were missing or went missing because of the violence. And so I did get, I did get a chance to actually, you know, talk to them and spend time with them. And they all um, received the work positively. They all encouraged me to continue making the work, um, which I'm not going to lie, I was scared. Uh, the, you know, the first time that I showed in El Paso, I wasn't sure how the work was gonna be taken. But fortunately, being able to have to have conversations with these uh, survivors, in a sense, you know, I was able to kind of feel vindicated in that I am trying to be as truthful as I can with with the subject matter, and and I think it shows, and I think they're re they're receiving it well. I've shown also in Mexico City twice now, and it's been the same the same um, the same response in that I spoke with people who uh, have been both affected and not affected and they all were encouraging in, in what's happening. And they tell me that it is important work that we need to do. I am not the only artist who's doing work about what's happening in Mexico as far as the violence go or the drug trade. Um, there's, you know, there's Teresa Margoyes is definitely the more famous one, but there's several artists who have tackled this issue. So, so um, the, do you see your work as activist? as if you're doing activism in a sense? I mean, we're in the context of, of fine arts. I could mm -hmm. put a nice bow around it. And, and with that concepts of beauty and cultural concepts of beauty, early on in your, your presentation, you talked about that you could see these images um, uh, in, in the newspapers on, on a daily basis. And that culturally in Juarez, there's a different, um, uh, relationship to um, images of the dead um, mm -hmm. being shown in the cultural context, as opposed to, you know, here in America. So there's an element of the beautification of the grotesque, especially mm -hmm. in, I, I think, in American culture. If you could talk about that aspect of your work, I'm confident at some point you ran across uh, questions about around that, that issue, how could you, why are you um, within the references that you're using? Right, um, I mean, it, it is true. Mexican culture has a different approach to images of the death. I mean, we have the day of the death, which is a celebration rather than you know, a mourning uh, ritual for, for our deceased. And so there's a different relationship that we have with with the passing or with death in, us in, in that sense. So that is not as taboo as it is here in the US, um, but because I am based in the US and because I am Mexican and I, you know, it's still part obviously of my culture and my life. Um, so I kind of have to work with both at the same time. So I was aware and I'm trying to be as careful as possible to be, um, you know, to not utilize the shock value of images. One, because in Mexican society wouldn't really, wouldn't really work because it already exists there. I mean, last, you know, as, as I mentioned, these images already exist there and they're consumed daily. So it's not like this image, if I make them more violent, it's not like they're gonna do anything new. Uh, they would here in the US, but at the same time, that's not what I'm looking for. I don't want to shock US viewers or the rest of the world viewers, you know, in the sense of I wanna make them feel, uh, you know, sick about what's happening. Of course I am, but not physically sick, not, um, not being using that gore. Rather, I'm trying to humanize, um, you know, these people. And that's why I, I, I'm not playing judgments on, on their decisions. You know, they, are, they were still somebody's family. And that's basically what, what it comes down to me in that we need, it, it is Mexico losing these generations of, of young men and how can we change this? So going to, this, to the, uh, the idea of me, my work being activist or me being activist, I think I'm going there very gradually. I wouldn't call myself activist or that my work is activist at this point because it is too passive. I am showing and I am representing what's happening. And I think that's a start. Um, as I said, I'm not the only one. There's several artists doing this. And I think, you know, it is important. We're reflecting what's happening in our society, but I am not really actively going out there and, you know, trying to make change as an artist like a way, for example. Um, I think, you know, in the future that might happen and it probably it will have to happen as my work and my practice continues to evolve. That being said, who knows, you know, I might change completely, uh, I might change topics, uh, I don't know. Yeah, you know what I mean by activism? I understand that 
you know, it could happen in subtle ways. And uh, mm -hmm. I think um, it's just like every little step one takes, you know, um, it helps to illuminate, it, you bring people to the issue. Um, um, and, and once they see your work, they're, they're seeing, they're lured into something that's much larger from a, a cultural uh, perspective. So I, I would say from my perspective that, and you said passively, I would say more subtly that your work is very powerful um, and, and um, you, you're doing uh, activist work within a cultural critique mm -hmm. um, from, my, from my perspective. I'm gonna to go to the next question. Um, okay. Could you talk more about the filtering or distance the image making process creates from the events you are addressing? Uh, for example, in the most recent work you showed, the difference moving from the actual crime scene to the photos of the crime scene investigations to your reduction uh, reductive images that are derived from those photographs. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm obviously I am the filter. I am uh, filtering these images from the original source and into the viewer. And so I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to be as, as truthful as I can to, like I said, humanize, you know, this, the events and, and the people um, who have been, whose life they, lo you know, were lost. So, um, as you know, as far as the newer pieces, um, the shift there was actually something, not something that I planned, but kind of something that happened in the sense that my mom passed away a couple of years, uh, last year. And so that affected me obviously personally. And it also affected my work in the sense that I felt the need to not deal with the cadaver or the corpse for a time. But at the same time, I cannot stop thinking about what's happening in Mexico with all of these events. And so I, that's where the shift came from not concentrating on the casualties, but rather on the investi investigative part of it. And one thing that I'm finding out as I continue to do my research now and looking at these photographs with a different perspective is that, you know, I was filtering through just one lens. And there's many ways that, you know, any problem can be looked at. And I think um, I'm hoping that this new body of work, as I continue to develop it, it will lead me to another way of, of um, you know, showing the problem that's happened that Mexico has to the rest of the world. And hopefully all of these perspectives that I'm creating will, you know, unify into being more rounded or more complete to be able to incite some sort of change. Well, I got to say, I appreciate um, a comment you made about uh, how physical the printmaking process had become at a certain point when we're doing mm -hmm. these really, uh, I think it was a four foot plus by three foot size images of uh, drilling in the copper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so much of your, you, you talk about your process or some examples of um, that characteristics of the work that uh, you related to um, the violence in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, about how the, the, your physical um, process of making, uh, the time element, the, um, all of that which took place, how you were able to filter those into ideas that then um, expanded upon your justifications within the making, right. you know, the choices in the making. So um, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So um, I think as an artist, I mean, thinking purely as an artist, you know, not really thinking about subject matter or anything, you know, I want to be entertained. I want to do something that is going to make me want to do it. Firstly, obviously, and I learned very early that I am, I am very process-based, which is why I loved printmaking and why I, I pursue that as a practice. And eventually, you know, the traditional approach of making prints um, was just not enough for me. So I, I needed to somehow improve or add to the, to the medium by exploring and experimenting. And so that is part, something that has always been part of my nature as, as, a, as, as part of my practice. And so when it comes to the, 
to the subject matter, I don't necessarily develop a technique and then say, I'm going to make work using this technique. Rather, I let the subject matter kind of inform the technique that I'm going to be using. So I'm kind of wrestling with both. I'm wrestling, wrestling with the subject matter and I'm wrestling with you know, trying to make something unique or interesting or engaging for me as, as, a, as a tool, as a medium. And I wanna, I want to make sure that they have connections. And so some, a lot of the decisions that I make as far as the technique or that I end up developing do have direct connections within me. I, know, I don't know if they become apparent to the viewer and perhaps it's not even necessary that the viewer is really aware of those uh, connections you know, that I am assigning, but they are to me because I feel that that's the only way that I can feel truthful that I'm making the work in a way that is not fake. You know, that I'm not utilizing, um, um, yeah, that I'm just not faking, you know, or, or inventing things to, to justify my actions, but rather, uh, and so what, that's one of the reasons that most of my works, I, the most of my techniques are violent, because all of these images are coming from being violent. And so I, I feel the need that the, the technique has to re, re, uh, reflect that. We have another question just popped up here. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about uh, filtering distance, uh, about the filtering or distance uh, the image making process creates from the events you are addressing? Right. Well, I mean, I think that's going to happen regardless. You know, there's always going to be a distance between, even from the original photographer. I mean, they took the, they take the photographs and then they're published and and then they kind of move on and, and the viewers will always take them, you know, based on their own personal experiences or, or ideals, I guess. So that will always, that's always going to be there in, in the images. I think what I'm hoping that I'm, tr you know, that I'm, or what I'm trying to do is that I am, am tr I'm able to direct the viewers within my work to, to show you know what I want them to get out of the images, you know, which is again the fact that we can't be so judgmental, and the fact that this this violence has to change and it has to stop. Uh, here's another question here um, mm -hmm. pertaining to the work in Germany. Do you think you captured the associated violence? that the architectural space held historically. Since you focus on the environment rather than the people, do you think now that you come back to the erasure pieces, you will incorporate the historical space in your hometown? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I actually didn't see it that way, but I think it might have been, yeah. Um, it is true that I concentrated on, on the on the structures, on the architecture of, of the place in Germany, primarily because like I said, I wanted to be careful, you know, being an outsider and not being really touched by the, this history of what happened, you know, uh, during the World War II era. So feeling, feeling that um, sort of distance that I had, I, I um, perhaps I censored or limit myself too much in not, in not really tackling it. And so the way that I did it was through utilizing the, the architecture as the vessel. I mean, in the end, we're all vessels. The human body is a vessel, the architecture is a vessel. So that was kind of like the way that I was able to approach it and made it easier or more accessible to me. Um, and so bringing the, you know, going back to Juarez and seeing that they had the, the houses as these vessels once again that are once again capturing the violence or the state of uncertainty and insecure that that citizens are you know have definitely is something that I um, that happened. I mean, I think it is. Um, yeah, it, it is. It, it, it did. That happened. I'm not sure that I was entirely aware of. I mean, I was aware to a certain degree, but probably not. I, I don't think I made that connection between the work in Germany and the work um, from what is when it came to the architecture. All right, here's another. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you create the illumination in the figures in the screen prints you made at TSU? Right, that that's actually a Jeff Dell technique. So he he uses 
uh, fluorescent ink on the back of the, so they're printed on UPO paper, which is not, uh, not cotton or rag based, but rather um, synthetic, so it's plastic. And so we printed a bunch of layers of really fluorescent uh, magenta. And when it's separated, it's not really attached to a, ba to a backing, but rather is separated or floating like a, a quarter of an inch, I believe. And so because of the fluorescentness of that, of that ink, it just really reflects a lot on the background. So that's how, that's how we were able to create those pieces. And then on the front of the, of the paper, we had to screen print a white to be able to black that fluorescence so that it wouldn't be shown on, on the front of the piece, but rather it's only on the back of the piece. So that's more of a technical you know, um, approach of, of how those pieces were made. And that's definitely something that Jeff Dell kind of came up with. He uses, it in, he uses it in his work a lot. And so when I had this opportunity of coming down and visited him and, and make work with him and his students, I, I immediately told him, it's like, I want to learn your technique and try it out within my work. And he was receptive. So we, we were able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to shift a little um, mm -hmm. as we filter for another question. You know, you, you, sp you spoke about um, um, humanization in, in one of the, I think it was the first question. And I, I posed a question to you, how do you humanize uh, images of dead bodies or hum mm -hmm. dead humans uh, whose fate have come at the expense of, of violence um, or an inhumane act uh, in light of the, the current um, um, culture we live in in America with so many um, uh, people coming, uh, losing their lives to, to a violent act or violent acts. One comes to mind when thinking about inhumane is um, George Floyd's death. Right. Have you thought of um, how your work um, speaks to broader um, ethnic um, perhaps gender, uh, a broader context of, um, with regards to issues of violence or acts of inhumanity? I, I do, and um, I am hoping that my work, while it's specific, um, I'm hoping that it, become, it can become universal. And so this is also one of the reasons that my work at the beginning it was kind of more abstract in that it takes away really the placement or in a way the ethnicity. Um, I think for the later portraits, you know, the ethnicity can't go away because, you know, we, uh, we do have certain features, you know, uh, Latin Americans or Mexicans specifically, we have the, the specific features. And so looking at those faces, you know, they will always look like somebody from Latin America or from Mexico. But I am hoping that, you know, these are problems that are universal. I mean, the Philippines have, have also um, a drug trade problem. And so definitely my work and my images and what I'm talking about can be applied to them as well, or they can have similarities there. And as you mentioned with, you know, George Floyd and, you know, all the violence here in the U.S., while the, the, the events are completely different, um, because I am not referencing those events necessarily too specifically, at least not in some of the work, like specifically the portraits, I guess. Um, I am hoping that those be can become universal and seen this way. One of the reasons that I haven't really branched out in using imagery, for example, from police violence here in the US is mainly because I just have so much content just from Mexico. And I feel that because the direct, more direct connection to me is the way that I'm able to approach it more truthful and I guess more, not necessarily easier, but it, it does make it uh, more accessible for me to speak about these issues in the hopes that it can become more than just about what, you know, what Mexico is, yeah. is going through. Um, but I have not, uh, you know, discarded necessarily using conflicts in other in other areas. It's just that for whatever reason, you know, the violence in Mexico keeps coming back into my work and being so specific about it. You know, it's interesting about the, the, the some of the images that keep coming back to me. And, and I, I, I <clears throat> particularly about the images of violence relative to um, the, the images that come from the newspaper. Um, you seem to be interested and really, really in, in invested in 
what people think about these images. And I, and I say that by thinking about what images you choose or select, what parts you select um, mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of, of the image. And, and there is a, an element of transformation that you as an artist, um, you use your artistic license to make certain decisions about what to exclude, exclude, um, to um, um, extract and to what degree. So you make active choices, but you seem to be very interested in that, that the fact that people see that these are human, a reference to a human being. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I do take in consideration the viewer a lot because the work is really about that. It's about changing perspectives and in, in accepting that we all have flaws and you know, it doesn't matter the, the choices that we make, whether the wrong thought of being wrong or you know, really being wrong, there, I guess maybe I'm hopeful that we can all change and that by showing this in my, in my work, people will understand this and, and be more caring for each other, you know, that to have, to be able to create a better world. I mean, right now I am just so distraught with the state of the world really with how we are so divided and we will always have different points of views but we can still live with them. Just because we don't agree on something doesn't mean that we're enemies. And I think that's, I think that's why it's so important to me what the viewer thinks, because I am trying to incite a change, at least in a personal way, more hopefully in a universal way, obviously. But um, yeah, this, uh, um, this is why I care what, what the viewer thinks. Also, I mean, I'm trying to be as honest as, and as careful with, with these images. I did tell myself that if, I would ever get a comment from one, from a family member or a survivors from the violence in telling me that what I was doing was wrong and that I was um, uh, capitalizing on it or you know that it, I was not being truthful or making justice to the subject matter. That would be the moment that I would start making that type of work. And that's, this is one of the reasons that I, I was really scared when I showed in Mexico and when I showed in El Paso because I think I'm doing the right thing, but I could be wrong. And it was really rewarding to hear, you know, from survivors and family members um, that I am right and I seem to be on the right direction. And so now I still feel the same way in that if somebody tells me, you know, that I'm doing something wrong, I will consider it more. I feel, I feel more empowered now though, to say, well, maybe we can have a disagreement with that but I know that I'm not entirely wrong. And so it might make me reflect differently and try different, you know, different venues or different approaches to the work to make sure that I am being as truthful and, as, uh, and making you know, as much justice as possible to these people. I, I don't think you're wrong. I think you're doing the work that um, you as an artist, a creative source need to be doing. I think you're asking questions I, in fact, enjoy the fact that you, you circled back uh, and you're looking at another element, another aspect of the process. Um, you started with that first image of the little child, the reference to a little child, and then another image progressively ended up with an image of a, of a figure crouching mm -hmm. over, um, photographing what appeared to be a negative or blank space where you're utilizing the, the, the raw paper I, I thought that was a, a pretty impressive uh, way of engaging the viewer and bringing um, the viewer into the space, into the work. And, and now you're circling back and looking not at the, the uh, literally the absence of life, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a blank paper and you have people that are engaged in the act of looking at a space um, that in a sense that signifies um, this very thing that you often talk about, which is death and loss and absence. 
to the actual representation of, of or as you put it, portraits of, of, of the dead, of dead people. Um, that's, that, as a concept, again, is about absence and yet the presence of something that was once there. You know, everyone knows, I'm sure you, you contemplate this as well, that death has no, um, uh, no limit to culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, so I, I think I, whether you, you're focusing on uh, what's specific to where you came from, um, you're still dealing with the universal um, reference to what the inevitable is, is death that uh, we, we will all face. And I, I hope to see how you begin to deal with those other concepts about, about death um, or continue to, to deal with those other concepts. Because I gotta tell you that the piece in Germany, uh, I really dug that as well. And I saw there were similar strategies that you employed. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the, the ultimate image is, is, um, is, is not the same, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I think it, the arrangements uh, of them um, as contemporary art um, are as strong, you know, as a different connect. You're going to get that and uh, from what viewers bring to, to um, looking, the process of engaging in art. But I, I found those those images from from Germany as powerful. Thank you. Uh, we have we have another question here. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we have another question? Yeah. How do you feel about your work? How how do you feel your work is received on the screen versus in person? Given the ways you incorporate violence and materials into your processes? Do you prefer your work to be viewed in person or do you welcome the a wider audience that the internet offers? Is the work received differently? That is a great question because uh, I personally feel that my work does not translate too well in a digital format. I mean, I think um, I've, been, I've been able to photograph them better and represent them better in a digital form but my work needs to be seen in person because there's a lot of nuance that the work has. I mean, the laser engraved pieces for one, I've always thought that showing them digitally makes the image more apparent. And when you see them in person, because there is really physical change between the embossments and more nuanced uh, tones from the, from the suit, they're much more alive, I guess I wanna say. And then the hand drill portraits have the same thing in that the paper flows as the viewer is walking around the pieces because they're floating, they're not framed. And they are physical also in that you can see where the paper was punctured or, or torn through the, through the process. There's dust on the floor every time we install them. So it becomes more of an ex experiential um, you know, moment. But I think, I mean, I feel that the digital representations are okay. Um, and I'm, I just redesigned my website and I'm really happy with it. And I think the work show, looks good on the website that I just did, but I would, I prefer that my work is seen in person for sure. Yeah. Miguel, I know you have another um, meeting. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to thank you for your time. We get past this pandemic we will definitely like to bring you back. So that last person um, and that last question uh, could perhaps be answered um, in person and, and, the, and maybe you could bring some physical works because I, I've had the, um, um, the pleasure of, of seeing them in the process and up, up close, I was fascinated totally by the, um, mm -hmm. the drilling that you were doing in the sheetrock. Um, and I do hope you revisit that a little bit more. I, I thought that was a, uh, one that, um, in terms of its ideas, um, we're, we're right on line with what you were thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we're going to have to go, man. Again, thank you so much. Um, if we have uh, any additional questions, would you be interested in, in answering? Definitely send them my way and I'll send them back. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll answer them, send them back. Thank you so much, Michael. 
It was a pleasure, really, and hope to come visit you in, in Houston for sure. Yes, we'll work on that. Thank you guys uh, for um, being here. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the questions. And we'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye, Miguel. Bye-bye.